Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm coming to you with my March wrap up. I'm pleased to say that March was a far better reading month for me than February was. I really enjoyed the majority of what I read this March. I did have a couple of kind of forgettable things, sadly enough. Let's just get right into it because we're probably going to be here for a while. My pick for the March of the Mammoths this year was the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens. I had another book on my list that I really wanted to get to for uh, March of the Mammoths that I didn't even begin to pick up. Uh, so that was a little bit disappointing to me, but I am pleased that I did finish one of my picks for the month, and that was the Pickwick Papers. I don't know that I would have picked up the Pickwick Papers on my own for a very long time, uh, were it not for the Dickens versus Tolstoy book club that's being hosted by Emma from the channel Emmy and Carolyn from Carolyn Marie Reads. This was the pick for February and March, uh, and this is Dickens's first published novel, and I think you can tell that. I really think you can. I rated this four stars, but parts of it in my heart have a five star. I just really, really enjoyed this. I could not possibly have enjoyed this more. Uh, there is kind of a section towards the middle that you do feel is getting kind of tedious and is getting very repetitive because the interesting thing is about the Pickwick Papers, it's written in a very episodic manner and it is a comic novel and it was serialized. And I think you can clearly see that. You know in this book in particular exactly where each issue stopped. The Pickwick Papers focuses on this group of guys whose goal is essentially to go around and record interesting stories. They are the Pickwick Club. They get involved in a lot of really crazy shenanigans and things that are just almost slapstick funny. And there are definitely instances in this book that you laugh out loud at. But I was kind of led to believe, since the novel is a comic novel, that there wasn't going to be much to it in terms of social commentary or kind of a deeper discussion. And that's wrong. There is a lot of really heavy stuff touched on in the Pickwick Papers, specifically in these stories that they are hearing from people who they come across in their travels. So often somebody will come in for a chapter tell this interesting story uh, and then they go away and it's no longer relevant to the book at all who they were. My pink tabs mean love and nearly everywhere that there is a pink tab, the only place that I ever put a pink tab was on a story, was on one of these stories told by these kind of one-off characters. There was a Christmas Carol type story that happened with goblins in this book that was genuinely incredible. There was another story that was kind of like the prodigal son. I mean, it was just really interesting and Dickens uses these stories to really show off. That's where his language is the most beautiful. That's where his prose really stands out. Uh, and so you can tell even from the very beginning that Dickens was something special. I loved this. I mean, I just absolutely loved this because there was also an element of courtroom drama to this that I thought was really interesting. I've been buddy reading Bleak House with a colleague of mine for a few months now. And Bleak House also kind of centers around the chance to record. It centers around a court case that's been going on for a long time. Uh, and so I think the Pickwick Papers is an interesting compliment to Bleak House. I am really struggling with Bleak House and might DNF it. And so is my colleague, so I don't feel nearly as bad about it. If it was just one of us who was struggling, I would say it was me that I personally maybe wasn't in the mood for it. But because both of us are struggling, I wonder if it's just not for me. But I think Pickwick handled this in a really interesting way because they went to court for something that was so stupid. But he suffered very real consequences for it. The character suffered very real consequences for something that we would think is absolutely ridiculous. Why was he brought into court for this in the first place? But it really wound up being a genuinely interesting and introspective look at England's court system at the time. And it painted a nasty portrait of lawyers. I mean, every kind of stereotype you can think of in your head about a lawyer that occurred in the Pickwick Papers. Uh, and so a lot of the social commentary and things that you associate with Dickens were couched by humor and by really off the wall situations. There were a lot of really beautiful quotes in this. Uh, this might be 
on my favorites of the year at the end of the year. That's how much I enjoy this. And I am curious to see how other people in the Dickens versus Tolstoy book club received this. I'm interested to see if other people really liked it because I do think the stylistic choice of making it so episodic, it's very much like a sitcom. If you catch the beginning and you remember who all of the characters are, who kind of one of the overarching villains is, then you could pop in at any other point in the book and largely know what was going on. You wouldn't have lost anything if you had missed an installment when this was being serialized. And I think that really will not work for some readers. And I actually would have said that I would be one of those, that I would be somebody who struggled with that. But shockingly enough, I absolutely loved everything about this book. I just absolutely loved it. And I loved the writing style. A lot of beautiful quotes, like I said, a lot of beautiful imagery, a lot of descriptions of the countryside, which is very unique for Dickens, in my opinion. Uh, this is one of my favorite Dickens novels now. Next, let's talk about The Splendor Before the Dark by Margaret George. So this was my audiobook pick for the month, and this is the second in the Nero duology, so it was the final in the Nero duology, and I started this back in January, and I have to say, I really love her writing. I really think she has a gift for making people very endearing, for making historical characters very, very engaging. And it's not really difficult, I guess you could say, to make Nero an interesting character because Nero is an interesting figure historically. But this book took everything that I thought was a weakness about the first to an extreme. Something else that was really expanded on and taken to an extreme in this one that I really did not like about the first book is that Nero is completely and totally whitewashed. I talked about this in my weekly reading vlog that I did at the beginning of the month, but there is literally an instant at the very start of this book during the Great Fire of Rome where Nero is out there firefighting because of course he was. And he sees somebody say, I'm a Christian, God, I am ready to bring on the second coming. I am ready for the end times. And he sees them cast a torch onto a house, essentially setting a fire. And so he can walk away and say, the Christians did it. I actually saw a Christian set a fire. And so in no way, shape, or form were you ever in doubt that Nero might have had something to gain by the fire. And that's just one instance. Nearly everything else that Nero is kind of condemned for in the historical record is thrown onto the women in his life. This happened a lot in the first book. It was thrown onto his mother. And this book is somewhat thrown onto his wife, his second wife. And I think that does Nero himself a disservice because these books make you think a little bit that Nero is a bit of a bumbling fool that's just being led around and other people around him are trying to help him lead and they're trying to do the right thing for him. But Nero is just this guy with good intentions who doesn't have a clue what's going on in his own court, let alone in the empire. And so you walk out of these books actually thinking that Nero is a little bit of a ditz, even though you also really like him because the books paint him in such a sympathetic light that you feel really sorry for him. You think there's no way his life could have turned out any differently and nothing is his fault because all of these different circumstances culminated in putting him in this place in time. And so it's absolutely not his fault. He just couldn't have escaped it. And after reading this, I have been reading a biography of Nero. Uh, and it's very interesting to see how different things are portrayed in a biography uh, versus in this historical fiction. And now this is historical fiction, so I don't really want to argue with her about that. She definitely wanted to do this. She says this in her author's note at the end of each book that she wanted to rehabilitate Nero's image. But I think it can be done without making him seem like this sweet summer child who's never done anything wrong in his life. Hopefully I will finish that biography soon and I will wrap that up next month. But it has definitely been interesting uh, to compare this historical fiction series with a more modern biography. I do think the ancient histories that discuss Nero are fairly biased. Uh, and I think they blame him for things that are so far out of the realm of possibility that it makes you question their legitimacy, in my opinion. So in their own way, sometimes I think of the ancient histories a bit like historical fiction. But Margaret George went to the totally opposite end, whereas the ancient histories, I think, blame Nero for things he certainly didn't do. Margaret George's argument is 
Nero never did anything wrong. Uh, and so that's a really interesting perspective to take, and I think it made for a very interesting duology. I did rate this four stars, but I had my issues with it. But the best books are the ones like these that lead me down a rabbit hole of research, and now I am completely and totally obsessed with Nero, and I'm trying to read everything about him. So I always appreciate a book that inspires a new obsession and that also inspires a discussion, which I think these books definitely do. So I do highly recommend this if you like historical fiction. Margaret George is a giant in the realm of historical fiction, and I will definitely be reading more of her. An arc that I read this month was Down Comes the Night, and I absolutely loved this. This took me completely by storm. So this is a YA fantasy and it is set in such an interesting fantasy world. It is set basically in a fantasy version of Victorian England. And I would also say Victorian Scotland because the setting for a large portion of the book is at a manner that I believe and that I kind of conjure to look like Scotland. Uh, so it was just a really fascinating fantasy world. And I was also totally and completely obsessed with the romance. In its own way, this is not a very typical fantasy. I would almost tell you this is a bit of a fantasy mystery. Uh, so there are definitely larger kind of typical fantasy things ongoing, but people have been going missing towards the border of these two warring nations. And essentially the plot of the book becomes what might have happened to them. And it's really gothic and Victorian in feel. It is set in this haunted manor house that I picture as being in the Scottish Highlands. I picture as being surrounded by fog at all time. Maybe you can see a stag off in the distance. Maybe you can see some heather. I really got into this. I thought the atmosphere was just absolutely incredible. And like I said, the romance was so strong. This is a little bit of a hate to love romance, but it felt very organic to me. And it also actually did feel like hate to love. I think a lot of people say hate to love when they really mean dislike to love. And in a novel with a lot of strong elements, the romance was potentially the strongest element here. I had a lot of fun with this. I just thought this was really unique and it came out towards the very beginning of March so you can get your hands on it. I loved this and I can't wait to see what else comes from this author. I rated this four stars. On to my biggest disappointment of the month, which was The Lost Apothecary. Now this was a debut that came out this month and it was my book of the month choice this month. And you would think based on all of the hype that this book has to be incredible. It sold out on book of the month the day they opened up you know, the slots for March. And so everybody I saw on the book of the month Facebook pages that I'm on was really excited about this basically because it sold out. And there was a lot of hype around it before it was chosen as a book of the month pick. There were a lot of people who desperately wanted this to be chosen by book of the month. And so I think I bought into the hype with this and it wasn't the best experience. This is a dual timeline narrative taking place half in modern day and half in the late 1790s. And I really hated everything that took place in the past. I absolutely hated the 1790s storyline, which I think is the opposite to most people. I think if you liked this book, you really liked it for what was going on historically. But I actually found the modern day storyline to be the most engaging. But on the whole, I didn't find the book to be engaging at all. It's very, very short. And because of that, you might think, well, this book has to be packed. But it's actually not. It's a book that, in my opinion, should have been a novella or should have been entirely historical. I think there was enough on either end to make this wholly a modern day storyline or wholly a historical storyline. This was just so disappointing to me. I rated this two stars and I feel like that's generous. I thought the writing was nice, so I gave it two stars. And it did inspire some anger in me. There is a storyline in this in the modern day uh, with our main character's husband that genuinely infuriated me and that made me angry every time I picked up the book. And so I do have to give the book something for that because it did inspire a real emotion in me. But everything else just fell totally flat for me. And I think I'm not the odd one out here. I think a lot of people bought into the hype with this one and then have been disappointed by it. So I'm glad I'm not the only one, but I did have desperately high hopes for this because look at the cover. 
Isn't it just absolutely beautiful? This one was a real shame and I did rate it two stars. Speaking of book of the month, I also picked up the final revival of Opal and Nev this month because this was also a debut that was written in kind of a band nonfiction style, so in an interview format. And I'm a bit of a sucker for that because, as I've stated before, and I'm sure many of you know now, uh, in my past, I was very much into hair metal uh, and I read quite a few music biographies in my day. And I enjoyed all of them largely because of that format. Format. I think there is a level of casualness to it and also a level of kind of like sitting down with your friends and learning secrets because a lot of bands do often take the opportunity when they sit down with a journalist or with a writer to craft their band biography. They often will be pretty straight up about things that happened. And so I often like when a fictional book tries to replicate that feel and tries to kind of go gritty with it. This one did that in a way that I thought was very, very interesting. There are some obvious comparisons here to Daisy Jones and the Six, which was also written in a similar format, and that also worked very well for me. But I found the storyline of this one to be a little bit more engaging than Daisy Jones and the Six. So this fictional band is a very interesting dynamic because it is set up that Nev, the guy, is this kind of skinny, white guy, folky, uh, and he definitely needs something to kind of inject some life into his music and to make him more popular. And so the record label and his agent would really like him to sign with a black woman. And so that's what happens. That's who Opal is. And so there is a really interesting discussion around race in this book and around how rock and roll kind of formed out of jazz and blues. And yet it developed into a section where black people were not welcomed. Um, rock and roll became a very white focused music scene. And so it is seen as a real point of discussion that Opal would ever want to enter that circle, that Opal would ever want to join up with Nev. And there is a mystery element to this story that I knew nothing about before going into it, and I'm not going to tell you anything about it. But I do think it's interesting that it's not been talked about very much at all, but I think it is the most compelling part of this book. I think you were reading this to really figure something out. And then in the end, the book doesn't really want to give you definitive answers on anything. It doesn't want to give you definitive answers on what happened in the past, on what might happen in the future. It is just a really interesting work of fiction because most of the time that I was reading this, I was constantly thinking, well, I've not heard that song. And I can't believe as into classic rock as I am that I've never heard of Opal and Nev. And so I started going down a rabbit hole of thinking a little bit that they were a real duo, that they really released an album. Uh, and so it was just a really fantastic reading experience. It is of course set up that they are uh, telling their story to a journalist because they might go on a reunion tour. Uh, and so there's a lot of really interesting discussion happening in this book about the music scene in general, about how historically rock and roll has developed. I really, really, just enjoyed this and I liked it better than Daisy Jones and the Six. I haven't heard very much about this one, but I hope more people pick it up. I rated this four stars. I also read this month The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne and this is another one that I absolutely loved. I also rated this four stars because this is truly one of the most exquisitely written books I have ever read in my life. This book is so beautiful. Every page, it felt like I was underlining something. I was writing something down in my quote journal. It's just so beautiful. But perhaps the most fascinating thing about The Marble Fawn is that this book on its own has an incredibly interesting history. Uh, so Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote this. It kind of became unintentionally a bit of a guidebook to the city of Rome because this book is about um, basically artists in Rome. One of them looks a bit like uh, the famous marble fawn statue and they hit a lot of the greatest hits of Rome in this book. They go to a lot of the really most famous places that you could possibly go in the city. And so it became a thing where you would read this book when you were in Rome and you would get your photograph taken and you would tuck it between the pages of this when they were at the place where you got 
your photograph taken. So let's say they were at the Coliseum. You tucked your photograph in right at the page where they were on the Coliseum. You did the same thing for the Pantheon. Uh, and so one year, this is published. The next year, the family photo album is invented. And there is actually a connection between this book being published and the photo album being invented. Is that not crazy? Absolutely insane to me. And I honestly see why this book became a guidebook to Rome because it talks about it in such exquisitely lush language. It's so beautiful. You really feel like you're there reading it. I feel like I can easily envision everything that he's talking about. I can feel the heat when he talks about it being sticky. I can see the foliage that's coming out of the cracks in the roof of the Colosseum. It's just so vibrant and so real. And in fact, it is so beautifully written that I largely didn't care what the story was. I found myself not caring anything about the plot and just wanting him to describe more of the monuments of Rome. And I just wanted to hear him talk about the forum for 400 pages. And I would have read that book and I would have rated that book five stars. So this only got four stars because there was a little bit too much plot for me, which is a sad thing to say. I actually think in general, the plot was interesting, but I think it falls by the wayside a little bit. And in many ways, since I finished this, I have forgotten about it. I have forgotten what was going on, what kind of the bigger elements of the story were, but I do remember how absolutely beautiful the language was. And if you love the city of Rome, I think you should pick this up because I think it's an absolute delight. I think if you have been to Rome, it offers such a really beautiful perspective on the city. And I think if you've never been to Rome, you will feel like you went after you read this. It's just absolutely incredible. And this edition does include a map of Rome. So if you're unfamiliar with the layout of the city, of the modern city anyway, it will help you to kind of have a map to reference, I think. There was a whole chapter in here dedicated to the characters going through one of the catacombs in Rome, the Christian catacombs. And one of the main characters got lost. And when she returns after they scream for her, um, she's kind of accompanied by a guy. Uh, this guy supposedly saved her, but they have been hearing all these rumors that there are ghosts in the catacombs. And they firmly believe that this guy who's with her is a demon and not actually a man. And so the imagery for this character who aided her in the catacombs throughout the book, he is consistently described as a specter, as a ghost, as a demon. Equally, there was a part where he discussed Fever, if you were in Rome in the summer, you stood a pretty high chance of catching the fever that would kind of come in along the river. And he describes how the fever would spread. He describes how death is on the wind with you, that when you were looking at these beautiful monuments, you're about to join them in the sands of time. I mean, it's just absolutely exquisite. Um, but here is a quote from the very beginning of the book that I think kind of tells you what the rest of the book is going to be. From one of the windows of this saloon, we may see a flight of broad stone steps descending alongside the antique and massive foundation of the Capitol towards the battered triumphal arch of Septimus Severus right below. Farther on, the eye skirts along the edge of the desolate forum where Roman washerwomen hang out their linen to the sun, passing over a shapeless confusion of modern edifices piled rudely up with ancient brick and stone and over the domes of Christian churches built on the old pavements of heathen temples and supported by the very pillars that once beheld them. At a distance beyond, yet but a little way, considering how much history is heaped into the intervening space, rises the great sweep of the Colosseum with the blue sky brightening through its upper tier of arches. Far off, the view is shut in by the Alban Mountains, looking just the same amid all this decay and change as when Romulus gazed thitherward over his half-finished wall. We glance hastily at these things, at this bright sky and those blue distant mountains, and at the ruins, Etruscan, Roman, Christian, venerable with a threefold antiquity, and at the company of world-famous statues in the saloon, and the hope of putting the reader into that state of feeling which is experienced oftenest at Rome, it is a vague sense of ponderous remembrances, a perception of such weight and density in a bygone life of which this spot was the center, that the present moment is pressed down or crowded out, and our individual affairs and interests are but half as real here as elsewhere. Viewed through this medium, our narrative, 
into which are woven some airy and unsubstantial threads intermixed with others twisted out of the commonest stuff of human experience may not seem widely different from the texture of all our lives. Side by side with the massiveness of the Roman past, all matters that we might handle or dream of nowadays look evanescent and visionary alike. I'm sorry I'm boosting my rating to five stars. This is an all-time favorite. I have literal chills reading that, and that's essentially the experience of reading this book as a whole. You feel chills on almost every page. It is so, so gorgeously written. The prose is just stunning. I mean, my quote journal is basically a copy of this book word for word. It is that absolutely beautiful. Uh, and so if you love the city of Rome, I highly recommend it. If you love books about art, I would also highly recommend this because it focuses on some really interesting art pieces that I don't think get a lot of attention, especially when talking about Rome. This is truly a masterful novel. And yes, I'm bumping my rating up after having read that. How can I give this book anything less than five stars? I think this is a new all-time favorite. Absolutely exquisite. Maybe I should do a full review for this. Last but not least, I reread the entire Grisha trilogy this month with Svea. I will link to her channel down below. If you were not following her, you absolutely should be uh, because she and I have very similar tastes in terms of classics, though she often reads a lot of modern classics and I definitely need to get more into that. But I think you would really like her perspective if you enjoy my channel. So we read Shadow and Bone, Siege and Storm, and Ruin and Rising. And I have to tell you on this reread, Ruin and Rising became my favorite in the series. I'm really shocked uh, because for years I've considered Siege and Storm, the second book, to be my favorite, but I think this reread has cemented my love for Ruin and Rising. So the Shadow and Bone TV show is coming out in April, and I have been wanting to reread the Grishaverse for a long time, so I decided to use this as an excuse. Uh, and Svea was kind enough to read these with me. And it has been really, really fun to read this trilogy with someone else and to reread it with someone else because I think we both noticed things this time through that we didn't the first time. And I think our opinions have been changing on things as well. But the Grisha trilogy is my favorite series of Lee Bardu goes. I know that's controversial. I know a lot of people prefer Six of Crows, but I really, really love this series. And having just reread it, my love for it has totally been cemented. I'm thinking of doing a little series review video on this because I think people judge the Grisha trilogy pretty harshly because it is very tropey. And yes, there are a lot of tropes in this. This is very classic YA. I believe the first book came out in 2012. Uh, and so it deals with the chosen one trope. It deals with a love triangle, of course. Uh, and there are a lot of other tropes involved in Shadow and Bone. And I will say, does she turn these things on their head? No. But does she write these tropes to be the best that they could possibly be? Yes, I think there are a lot of people who really despise certain tropes now because they think they're overdone. But tropes become overdone because they work. And I think Shadow and Bone and the Grisha trilogy at large really exemplifies why the tropes that Lee Bardugo played with in this trilogy, why they are so successful, why they have become overdone. Every trope she does in this series is done to perfection in my opinion. And I think there is a really interesting discussion to be had around the Grisha trilogy. I really, really love this series. This is my favorite YA series of all time. In my adult life, I have become a more emotional person and I have become definitely a more emotional reader. I can never recall having been choked up at a book in my life when I was actually a teenager. But the first time I read Ruin and Rising, in 2015. I remember crying. I think it is the first book that I ever truly shed a tear at. And I wondered if it would have the same emotional intensity for me this time around on a reread. I wondered if because I knew what was coming, if it would pull the rug out from under me. I wondered if because I was older, would I view these books as too young? But I finished that book and I did legitimately shed a tear. Yes, the Grisha trilogy is very stereotypically YA. Yes, it is very fast paced. Yes, it has a love triangle, but I think it has 
a great deal of heart. Uh, and so if you have ever considered giving it a chance, I think now's the time with the TV show coming out, which also looks absolutely incredible. But this is definitely my favorite YA series of all time. And I am so glad that I reread these. So those were all the books that I read in the month of March. If you have read any of these, I would love to hear what you thought of them down below. And I would love to know too what you read in the month of March. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.